Hello there, and welcome to the prep portion of Beginner's Boot Camp. We are going to start by figuring out how to prep your pieces in the best way possible so that you can ensure that your finish lasts for as long as it possibly can. Uh, one of the most saddening and frustrating things is to get a beautiful finish on a piece of furniture that suddenly fails. It flakes off, there's bubbles, um, it just breaks your heart. We're going to start with introducing you to some of the items that you're going to see me using. Uh, first is this guy. One of the things I hate about sanding is the crazy dust that it makes. And especially if your workspace is one where you do the sanding and the painting all in the same place, you just don't want it. You don't want it up in the air. You don't want it all over everything. It's gross. One of the things that I love to do is take my dry back and I take my DeWalt orbital sander um, and it comes with the dust cap. Now I've taken the dust cap off so that all the dust would blow out of here. However, using the vacuum, I'm able to take the hose and attach it and then apply tape. So all of that dust goes straight into that vacuum and I don't have to worry about it being all over the place. Just a tip on the pointer that'll hopefully help you whatever you're doing. Um, also, I have got a couple of different grits of sandpaper. I've started with the 80 grit, um, and that's going to be the one that really kind of breaks into the finish and starts to get rid of anything that I want. Um, it kind of eats away a little bit faster than some of the grits of sandpaper, and then I'm going to work my way up to a 320 potentially, maybe a 220, uh, depending on what we're doing, but you'll see. The other thing is remember the wallpaper. Yes. The wallpaper. So to get that off, my plan of action is to use an iron. Now this is um, just the iron that I use in the garage. I wouldn't recommend using your household iron if you can. Just find one at the thrift store or something like that. Usually like five bucks if that at a thrift store um, and put it in your garage. I don't want it to get completely gunked up though because what if I need it for some purpose that I need a clean surface? Um, in which case you use parchment paper. We're going to use that to put a buffer between the wallpaper down there and the hot surface on the iron to allow us to hopefully do the work and not have any problems with um, sticking or anything like that. Let's get started. So we take our parchment paper and lay it down to create a barrier between our iron and the paper below. At this point, we really don't know what kind of paper we're dealing with here. So what we want to do is begin to heat it up and loosen up any glue that would be under the paper. Here, I'm finding that this is a very traditional paper-like wallpaper. There are no plastics. There's nothing making it want to bind together. Um, therefore, you're going to find that I'm using lots of different methods. Right now, I'm simply applying heat to the surface, pulling back, and beginning to remove the paper. As I continue to do this, I'm finding that the paper is just pulling apart in very small pieces. I decide to go grab a water bottle so that I can begin to moisten the paper and therefore allow the heat to also transfer into the glue backing um, a little bit better. You'll see me using my putty knife to score the paper. This is just like you'll find that people use in residential homes, on walls, and things of that nature. You score the paper and begin to introduce steam, um, water, heat, in order to begin having everything loosen so that you can pull it up. This begins to really help the job go a little bit faster. Um, so while it is coming off easier, I'm just like scraping away the little bits that are deciding that they need to stick a little bit more. Um, and I continue with this process for the rest of the time. And so anytime you have a project like this, again, there's no one right or wrong answer or uh, method for getting the task done. Know that you're going to come across situations that act a little bit differently than others. Be willing to figure those things out. It's like a puzzle. Um, 
sometimes and most of the time just the heat alone will do the job say you have veneer um, or laminate um, high heat with a um, iron or possibly a heat gun will really just make the glue want to separate and come up um, in this situation though with the the pieces that I'm pulling up being just so fragile they don't want to pull up in large sheets rather they just keep on breaking apart because it's just thin um, vintage wallpaper as you can see I have my orbital sander here and it's already connected to the hose of my wet dry vac. I've also placed my 80 grit sandpaper on there and we are ready to begin. As you can see, there are lots of layers, marks, and imperfections all across the surface that we'll be taking care of. Okay, so now let's take a deeper look. When should you sand? Why should you sand? Why should you not sand? First of all, why are you refinishing the piece of furniture? Why are you adding a new look to it? Um, is it going to be for you? Is it going to be for sale? That's going to be something that I always factor in, if I'm honest. I won't put quite as much in sometimes if it's just for me because those are just precautions that I don't necessarily have to take. I might want to repaint it in two months, so who knows. Um, but if you do want to do it for sale, for a client, or something like that, um, then you might want to go the extra mile. Do you need to sand down to bare wood? Usually, no. There's no good reason to. Here's the reason why. Um, if you have a brand new not a brand new, but a new to you piece of furniture, whether it's antique or whether it's vintage or whether it's, you know, modern, um, it has its own factory finish on it, okay? That factory finish has been sealing off that wood for years and years now, or months and months as it may be. If you remove that finish, what are you left with? All of the oils that were in that wood are going to have a place to escape. And so what you're left with is a higher probability of bleed, which is something we're all trying to stay away from. Personally, my opinion is don't try to strip down everything that you come across. Sometimes you're just creating more problems for yourself for no good reason. Um, part of the reason that many do go ahead and strip all the way down is because they just want that absolute no doubt about it prepped and taken care of surface that they're able to paint on. And that's great. Those are a lot of the same people that are also going to want to use oil-based products. You may or may not be that person that wants to use oil-based products. Personally, I like to enjoy my process as much as possible and I try to stay away from oil-based products. That's all there is to it. Um, I may use shellac sometimes, which is in and of itself um, not the easiest to use, but it dries so fast and levels so much that I make, you know, I make, um, I make it work for me whenever I'm using it. Um, but the purpose of using shellac or oil-based products is to go back and then again seal that wood so that you don't have any problems with bleed. If you're not going to go down to the bare wood finish, what do you do? For instance, right now I've got this painted table. Do I remove all of the paint? and how, um, or you have your own piece of furniture that has the factory finish on it, um, how do you tackle this, how much do you sand if you sand, we're going to talk about that. What I tend to do is test it. You can see right here where this has already um, been scratched away. It looks like they painted it white and then they did some sort of glaze on it. Um, and did not top coat the glaze. It's very important that you top coat your glazing, if, especially if it goes over a flat surface. That glaze definitely had to come up because I can see it doesn't have a good adhesion. Um, you want to test every part of the piece to make sure that the paint 
is um, has got a wonderful bond. If it doesn't, then what you're risking is your new paint going on there, adhering beautifully, but then that old paint coming off. So what I'll do is I will take a um, a wire brush or my sandpaper as I go. Constantly test the surface. I'm going to be sanding this down with my 80 grit, 80 grit sandpaper. Um, I'm going to give my top a very nice smooth finish. Right now it's very bumpy and funky and just not pretty. So that will most likely go down to bare wood, depending on what I find as I begin to um, begin to sand. Um, the rest of it, I will be using hand sandpaper, and I will continue to test it as I go. If I find anything is wanting to come up, then my goal is to use the sandpaper, and I'm going to sand it completely smooth to the point that the edges of that exposed area um, are nice and, and blended, um, and so that I know that the, the paint isn't going to want to come up. If it starts to want to chip away, then I'm going to encourage it to chip away the best that I can and try to remove it, and then sand the area smooth. Um, you just want a nice faded effect going from raw wood up to the painted surface that you're dealing with. Um, if you don't, then you're just going to have, you know, it's going to look gross later on as you're beginning to paint. It's just going to have that texture to it, unless you want a textured finish, which is absolutely fine, um, but you just may not want that. My next course of action is going to be taking my 80 grit. I'm going to throw it onto my DeWalt Orbital Sander. And that is already connected, as you can see, to the wet dry bag. Um, and I just used vinyl tape. I've got tape from football days whenever we used to tape the boys' helmets. And this is just um, a tape that you can find on Amazon or something like that. Use whatever's good for you. But it holds everything together so that I can allow the vacuum to go as I sand, therefore kicking up far less sand. So here we go. Or far less dust, as it may be. Okay, here we go. I have my 80 grit sandpaper on my sander and I'm going to continue to work away the finish as much as possible. Um, going in my passes mostly with the same direction of the grain, um, although if you begin to make circles and go against it a little bit, you'll see that it helps to kind of break the pattern of the paint um, and allow it to work a little bit better. As I go, I'm able to also see where there are spots that the paint is blatantly not adhered and is just chipping away. Um, so this is a good indicator that I'm going to have to go down to the bare wood in many areas. Also there are going to be places where the finish is completely failing and basically turns to a gummy kind of substance. Um, this can be due to oils in the wood um, that have come up into it because it wasn't sealed properly. This can also be due to moisture. As I continue to work, I can see where the planks come together. Um, and in between those planks, there seems to be a little bit of air and therefore there could have been a break in the finish. This would have allowed any sort of moisture or anything to come up and to interfere with the... Um, bond of the paint. This is actually evident in the area that you see me sanding now. And so in those areas that the paint wants to come up, just be sure to sand the edges where the paint meets the wood very smooth. You'll find with the 80 grit sandpaper that um, you're going to have a relatively smooth surface. But we are going to finish this off with a higher grit to give us a supremely smooth surface. Um, I prefer a 320, but as long as it's up above 220 or so, you should be just fine. Okay, and what we're taking a look at here is where the previous owner, uh, before they painted it, had sanded through the veneer in different areas. Um, this indicates that there could have been breaks in the veneer, or they simply sanded too far, making it too fragile, and it broke away before they painted. 
So where you see the white, um, those little slivers of white towards the edge, those are showing us where they painted into those crevices um, after they did all of that sanding. This tells us that we're not going to be able to have a stained top. Um, that was one of the original goals, but with the paint being inside the wood veneer like this um, and some of the wood veneer being missing, it's just not going to give us a beautiful look. Always be sure that you work this into your plan. Um, option A, Option B, Option C. Make sure there's flexibility. Make sure that, especially if you're working with a client, that there's room for that flexibility, especially with these pieces that have been painted um, after coming from the factory. You never know what you're going to find. One of the most frustrating things is to have an idea set in our minds, a look that we want to achieve, something we've promised to a client, and unfortunately we're just not able to execute it given the circumstance that we've been presented. Here we have another fun revelation. This isn't wood. This is going to be a particle board substrate. Um, and so we don't want to sand too much. We want to sand some of the paint smooth, make sure we have an even surface. More than likely we're actually going to end up playing with some of the texture that we've been given, but I'll be showing you how to tame those fibers. Okay, now here we have everything sanded smooth. Of course, there was some residue left over from all the wallpaper. All of that was brought up with the 80 grit sandpaper and then sanded even more smooth with my 320. The balusters at each end of the table um, are mostly going to stay intact. I'm grabbing my 80 grit sandpaper, my flexible sandpaper, and I'm going to give them a light scuff. However, all of the paint over here is really nicely intact. I don't have any problems with the integrity, although as I sand, I will reveal whether or not there are any concerns. But for the most part, this is going to stay put. Part of the reason for this is these guys are probably made of some sort of wood substrate, um, not real wood. And so we're going to utilize a lot of this paint as part of the texture that's going to form our really awesome bronze patina finish. Alright, and that concludes this portion of our prep videos. Next we'll be talking about laying our primer and cleaning and all that good stuff, so stay tuned for the next video.